Afternoon, everybody. Got a few items off the top before I get to your questions. Uh, first of all, we've taken another step in our ongoing efforts to disrupt terrorist networks. I can confirm that U.S. forces conducted a precision airstrike near Sarmata, Syria, on November 18th that killed Abu Afghan al-Masri, a senior al-Qaeda leader in Syria. Al-Masri, an Egyptian, originally joined al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and later moved to its Syrian affiliate. He had ties to terrorist groups operating throughout Southwest Asia, including groups responsible for attacking U.S. and coalition forces in Afghanistan and those plotting to attack the West. Al-Masri's removal from the battlefield represents another blow to al-Qaeda in Syria and demonstrates continued U.S. determination to target al-Qaeda leaders wherever they pose a threat to the U.S., our allies, and interests. Second of all, I want to provide you a readout of a call the Secretary had earlier today. Secretary Carter spoke this morning by phone with Kurdistan Regional Government President Masoud Barzani. They had a very productive call that was focused on the ongoing fight against ISIL. Secretary Carter thanked President Barzani for the courage of Kurdish fighters and for the KRG's close cooperation with the central government in Baghdad and the coalition in planning and executing operations to free Mosul. For President, uh, President Barzani, meanwhile, thanked Secretary Carter for the coalition's continued support to Peshmerga forces. Secretary Carter and President Barzani pledged to remain in close coordination as the Iraqi-led counter-ISIL campaign progresses in Iraq. And I do have an operational update for you with regard to that campaign. In Iraq, Iraqi security forces continue to clear areas in and near Mosul despite significant ISIL opposition. The ISF continue to make progress while uh, exercising commendable care to avoid civilian casualties. They've been dealing, among other things, with vehicle-borne IEDs and the use of human shields by ISIL. In the last 24 hours, the coalition conducted nine strikes delivering 72 munitions to support operations in and around Mosul. This remains a tough urban campaign, but it will end uh, with Mosul free of ISIL's rule. Meanwhile, in Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces continue to seize and clear territory north of Raqqa in preparation for that city's isolation and eventual liberation. Those SDF forces are now 20 kilometers from Raqqa. The SDF has essentially closed a pocket of ISIL forces now encircled by their advance, and they are clearing that pocket in preparation for future operations. In the last 24 hours, the coalition has conducted 11 strikes, delivering 35 munitions in support of the SDF, SDF's drive on Raqqa. And we continue to see indications that the simultaneous pressure on ISIL in both Syria and Iraq, combined with relentless strikes on ISIL leadership, is complicating ISIL's ability to reinforce and to command and control its forces. Lastly, as Americans prepare for the Thanksgiving holiday, just a reminder that around the world, our troops and DOD civilians are working to protect the nation. And as you might expect, the Department of Defense is working to provide as joyous a holiday as possible for those personnel who can't be home with their families. Uh, that is no small task. This week, the Defense Logistics Agency will provide for deployed service members in Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan, and Kuwait the following. 34,760 pounds of turkey. 32,550 pounds of beef, 21,450 pounds of ham, 28,980 pounds of shrimp, 9,114 pounds of stuffing mix, and 879 gallons of eggnog. Needless to say, we want to wish a happy Thanksgiving to our troops deployed around the world, uh, as well as those here at home and to their families in addition. And a happy Thanksgiving to all of you all as well. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Bob Burns. Peter, uh, I want to ask you about the letter that S Senator McCain sent to the Secretary yesterday in which he asked the Secretary to uh, suspend all the development of, and, and implementation of all rules and regulations that would change policy at DOD. Has he, in effect, uh, shut down the Secretary's uh, policymaking operation for the with two, two months left in the administration? The, the Secretary will continue to carry out his responsibilities as the Secretary of Defense, as he has uh, up to this point uh, through the end of his term. Does he have policies in process that he's going to be rolling out between now and the end of the... The Secretary will continue, Bob, to carry out his obligations as Secretary of Defense, continue to serve this Commander-in-Chief and do what he thinks is appropriate and necessary um, for the Department of Defense. So is he rejecting the re request that he suspend his... Uh, I, make, uh, I haven't seen the, the, the letter myself specifically. I'm not aware if the Secretary has read it, but of course we'll uh, work in collaboration with Congress, as the Secretary always does. He has a good relationship with Senator McCain, and uh, the Secretary is prepared to carry out his responsibilities uh, as required, and uh, will continue to do so. 
Phil. Um, would those responsibilities that will keep carrying out include hiring and firing? Uh, the Secretary of Defense will carry out his obligations as required. Because, uh, you know, news over the weekend came out that the Secretary had recommended uh, the dismissal of uh, Admiral Rogers. Um, so uh, apparently he's, he's recommending that, but he's, but he's not prepared to act on it uh, independently. I'm wondering uh, uh, why would Phil, that I'm not, I'm not going to get into uh, the private conversations between the President and, uh, and his Secretary of Defense. But does the Secretary have the authority to do that on his own, or does he need uh, the Commander-in-Chief? Phil, I'm not going to get into personnel matters here, and I'm not going to certainly get into the conversations uh, that the Secretary has had with the, with the President. Um, and, uh, and the President has spoken to this, and I, I think that would be best for me to leave it to the President. You're saying, Peter, that he did speak to the President about firing Admiral Mike Rogers. I'm saying I'm not going to discuss personnel matters from here, and I'm not going to discuss any of the private conversations between the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. Does the, uh, Secretary, I think does the Secretary have the authority, if he wanted to, to fire uh, an, an, an Admiral? Uh, Phil, uh, I'm not going to get into personnel, personnel matters here. Yes? About Afghanistan, as you mentioned, that, that there was a big attack. Do you think that uh, Daesh uh, is a big problem than Taliban now in Afghanistan? And did uh, the Daesh get their weapons from? So uh, obviously they're very concerned about any reports of uh, violence in Afghanistan, whether it's from Taliban or, or ISIL uh, in, in Afghanistan, and uh, concern obviously for the Afghan people. Uh, in light of this attack. Uh, I know that uh, we've worked very closely with the Afghan government uh, to uh, look at the threat that ISIL poses in Afghanistan. We've taken significant steps in Afghanistan under the leadership of General Nicholson uh, to address the ISIL threat uh, and made significant progress working alongside Afghan forces with uh, regard to that. Um, but it still poses, obviously, a threat to, to Afghanistan, and the people of Afghanistan will continue to stay very, very focused on, uh, on ISIL. Uh, wherever it uh, rears its its head, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq and Syria, whether it's other parts of the world. Jennifer. What does the Defense Secretary, what does Secretary Carter think about a four-star Marine uh, retired possibly taking his job? And what does he think about civilian control of the military? And it, would it be appropriate to uh, receive a waiver at this moment in time to have a uh, retired four-star to take his position? I. I know you're going to be disappointed to hear that I'm not going to wade in on uh, potential choices made by the next president-elect with regard to uh, this department and the next secretary of defense. Uh, it's, uh, the president-elect will make his decisions, and uh, it would be inappropriate for, for me to, to weigh in on that. But does he have strong views about civilian leadership of the military? Uh, I think the secretary believes that the uh, structure within the Department of Defense is a uh, is, uh, healthy structure and uh, has served the country well. Uh, and uh, again, he's uh, not going to weigh in on, on who might uh, replace him. It would be inappropriate. And why does Secretary Carter believe that the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command should be separated? What are the problems with having them combined? Um, the Secretary has said publicly in the past that it has uh, uh, been worthwhile to look at the structure in place right now to make sure that it is as effective as possible in a dealing with the evolving threats this country faces. Uh, and uh, that's a review that the President and others have acknowledged as well. And that's a, uh, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's a question about looking at the most efficient way to protect the American people. But what about it is not working right now? Um, you haven't heard the Secretary say that, that, uh, that it isn't working. Um, what he's said, and I think what the President has spoken to, is the fact that it's worth uh, reviewing uh, exactly the, whether or not this is the most efficient structure going forward. Yes, Tony. A couple things. One on the Al Masri hit. Can you tell us roughly how many core Al Qaeda leaders now are sought to exist now, 15 years after 9 11? Do you have a rough order on that? Uh, Tony, I don't from here. I can try and take that question, but I think. Uh, what we continue to demonstrate with this strike and with previous strikes is that uh, we continue to target uh, senior al-Qaeda leaders um, as they continue to pose a threat to the United States. And uh, we've demonstrated a willingness to do that, and, uh, and I think this is evidence of that as well. If you could find out, I mean, a few years ago, Secretary Panetta said there was something like 100 
were in Afghanistan of Al Qaeda. Yeah. That would be useful just for the record. Fifteen years after 9/11, we will we will try and get a number for you. It may be something that uh, we have to look to our other uh, the intelligence community as well. I have a couple of questions on Secretary Carter. When he came in office, he said he was a man in a hurry. A number mm -hmm. of initiatives he wanted to get in place. He's in the end game now with the last two months. What are some? Of, what are the one or two must complete initiatives? that he would like to get out before he's out the door? I think the Secretary has uh, carried out a number of initiatives uh, on his watch that uh, he feels very confident are not only in place, but uh, will uh, survive past his time as, as Secretary. Uh, he continues uh, to devote his efforts, of course, to the counter-ISIL campaign uh, and making seeing that through to the end of his term and seeing that as successful as possible while he is uh, in office, and I think he feels good about where that campaign is at this particular moment in time, but knows that there's significant work to do. Uh, we've talked at length about uh, his innovation agenda, um, some of the things he's put in place with regard to that. We've talked at length about the Force the Future initiatives, which are uh, incredibly important in terms of not just uh, uh, for the here and now and for his successor, but for years down the road. These are changes with regard to our men and women in uniform, um, that will have an impact, uh, not necessarily immediately, but, but uh, for years. And uh, I think he feels confident uh, that those changes are sound changes, uh, positive changes, changes that will make, uh, ensure that the force uh, of the future will be just as capable as the force he has today. Okay, the force of the future needs to be funded in the FY18 budget. What is the status of that budget plan? Is it near complete? And is the Trump transition team now reviewing the 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 budget and the budget right now? Well, Tony, you're talking about a fiscal year 18 budget when we don't have a fiscal year 17 uh, budget right now. So this is being prepared. Well, let me just make the point that the, as the secretary did the other day uh, during our trip, that uh, it's he's disappointed that we're once again confronted with a situation where we have to deal with a continuing resolution. The Secretary has been very vocal in his uh, call for budget certainty, the importance of budget certainty to this department going forward. And uh, that is a message certainly that he will continue to deliver in his final uh, remaining weeks in, in this position. Um, I'm, I'm not going to characterize where the fiscal year 18 budget is at this point. I'll leave it to the uh, transition, the President-elect's transition team to to tell you what it is, the information they're seeking at this particular moment in time from the department. Because you know this thing has to be put to bed by December in order to come out at some reasonable amount of time next year. Uh, is, it, is it near complete or is it still, is there still back and forth with the services on it? Uh, Tony, again, we've been focused so much on the current budget situation uh, that, yes, of course, work has been done towards the fiscal year 18. Uh, budget, but I'm not going to characterize exactly where it is at this particular moment in time, other than to say that the professionals within this department, uh, including those uh, responsible for the budget, are doing everything they need to to ensure a smooth transition, to make sure uh, that the, the certainty, as much certainty as possible, is put in place uh, for the next uh, administration and for our troops and men and women in uniform. Uh, they deserve that uh, certainty. Uh, they deserve a better situation in terms of the budget than what they're facing right now. Okay, fair enough. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Cook. Um, on exchange of uh, uh, mil uh, military uh, information between South Korea and uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. South Korea and Japan signed a military uh, information protection agreement. Mm -hmm. What is the U.S. The, uh, uh, position in this regard? Uh, we've been very supportive of efforts by uh, South Korea and Japan to enhance their own uh, security cooperation. Uh, we think this is a, an important step and uh, a positive step. And uh, of course, we encourage those two countries to continue their collaboration with regard to the security threats in the area. The U.S. supports these. Yes. Laurent. Thank you. Um, there was a, a, some confusion last week uh, when there were reports on the death of the Al-Qaeda leader you mentioned. Um, can, can you say, for instance, if that Al-Qaeda uh, leader you mentioned uh, was uh, someone who was close with uh, Zarqawi? And um, was, I also read things about uh, this Al-Qaeda being the, the cleric who, who really inspired Zarqawi and had really uh, Egyptian, Egyptian, Egyptian born uh, cleric inspiring Zarqawi. Is it the same guy or are we talking about a different guy? Uh, Laurent, I want to be. Uh, 
I don't want to provide information to you that I'm not 100 percent certain of. I, I know that, uh, as it's been conveyed to me, this is a legacy Al Qaeda leader who's had a leadership role, uh, both in Afghanistan and in Syria. Um, but as to his own uh, people he's impacted or had uh, direct uh, contact with within Al Qaeda leadership, uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak to that uh, without knowing uh, for certain. Egyptian? Yes, uh, as I pointed out, he, wa he was Egyptian. Yes. Um, back to NSA and Cyber Command. Uh, a lot of the congressional opposition to the split is based on the argument that Cyber Command doesn't have the capabilities and personnel it needs to stand on its own at this point. Does the Secretary believe it does have the ability to stand on its own? And at this point, is the split off the table for the remainder of this administration? Uh, I will just repeat what the Secretary has said before. He's uh, he's been very clear about the importance of uh, Cyber Command, the importance of protecting our own networks, uh, about uh, making sure that we are addressing the threats not only of today but the evolving threats of the of the future. Uh, and this has been part of the ongoing conversation uh, as we look at this structure. And I'm not going to predict the future as to what uh, decisions the president might make. Ultimately, this is a decision for the president to make. Yes. You mentioned earlier you're concerned about the living under the, uh, continuing resolution. Could you lay out some of the difficulties that creates you know, or the particular high, high uh, concerns you have on a, on a CR taking into March? Well, uh, uh, the concerns that you've had, uh, uh, you've heard from this secretary before, but every time we do a, a CR, um, there are implications for this department. It means that there are certain investments that are not being made. We're being funded at uh, existing levels, and that does not reflect uh, necessarily the changes and adjustments that, uh, that this department feels are necessary in order to make sure we're doing everything for our troops, uh, our civilian workforce, uh, and for the nation's security. Uh, there are questions, again, about uh, particular programs uh, that the Secretary has spelled out uh, our funding proposals for. Uh, and the fact that they are remaining at current levels, uh, again, restricts, in some respects, our ability to exercise the, the policy decisions uh, and the security of this country in the most effective way possible. It is not the right way to do budgeting. And uh, that's been a point that this secretary and plenty of others have made previously. Um, it is inefficient. It does more harm than good in terms of uh, certainty and being able to uh, put in place the national security uh, structure that uh, that the secretary believes is uh, the most effective means possible for te protecting the American people. Carlo, uh, Peter, just a quick follow-up on Afghanistan. Uh, there were reports that the ANSAF had begun, I think, for the first time to start conducting uh, combat or offensive operations um, in the country during the traditional sort of winter lull. Um, and from what I understand also, it is to sort of kind of push back the Taliban's expanding footprint in Kunduz in the north and in uh, Helmand in the south. Is it the department's opinion that this effort is, or this move signifies a sort of an increasingly deteriorating situation in the country? And uh, have a follow-up after that. I, I think, Carlo, the, what you've got is a situation in Afghanistan where they have set up a national strategy that General Nicholson has talked about in terms of how to confront uh, the Taliban, the challenge posed by the, the Taliban. Uh, that strategy, as we've detailed on multiple occasions, includes uh, ensuring that the Taliban is not able to take population centers. Uh, they've been effective in carrying that out, and uh, although it's been a, a difficult fighting season, they've been able, in a resilient fashion, to, to hold on to district centers, for example. Um, they've also been taking the fight, too, uh, the Taliban. And th I think this is a reflection of the kind of capabilities that the Afghan security forces now have in which they're leaning forward and taking the fight to, uh, uh, they're leading the effort to secure their own country. And this is, uh, this is decisions made by the Afghans and by the Afghan leadership as to how to conduct, uh, how to operate their forces, uh, particularly at this particular moment in time. And I think General Nicholson and the, everyone at Resolute Support is uh, supportive of what the Afghans are doing and will continue to, to support that effort. And also, can we expect an uptick in um, support, support operations by U.S. and coalition forces in countries? We, we stand prepared to, to support uh, Afghan forces as needed, um, and we'll continue the, the mission we have to the train and advise mission uh, with the Afghan forces. Uh, 
as we have been for the last couple of years, there's no change in our role, um, even though the Afghans may be uh, pushing, uh, again, operations into the winter months, uh, which may be unusual from years past. Yes, Ryan. Um, so back to the al Masri head really quickly. Was he, you said he was core al-Qaeda, but is there understanding that he might have been dual-hatted with al-Nusra or, you know, the, the regional branch there, or, or is he kind of, was, do we think he's separate? Uh, and was he active, was there an idea that he might have been actively plotting against Western targets or, or Western interests? This is someone, again, who's uh, had a long history with al-Qaeda, including in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the reason he was targeted was, uh, again, because of his role in al-Qaeda uh, in years past and currently. And uh, that's the reason he was targeted. If I just follow up on another question on Syria, you mentioned that the SDF was about 20 kilometers from Raqqa. Mm -hmm. Turkey today announced that they're going, after they take al Bab away from ISIS, they're going to move on Manbij to target the YPG. Is there concern that Turkey's military efforts now might be detracting from the SDF's ability to capture Raqqa? I think this is something that you've heard Colonel Dorian speak to this uh, recently. We remain very engaged with uh, our Turkish ally, their member of the coalition, uh, in terms of trying to, to best coordinate the fight against ISIL. We'll continue to do that. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation with them. They have legitimate security concerns uh, given the threat uh, posed to Turkey by ISIL. And uh, we will continue to work closely with, uh, with our Turkish counterparts with regard to that. Um, and uh, there are tensions in the area. We understand those tensions. We understand the concerns uh, expressed by Turkey. Um, and we're going to continue as the leader of the coalition to work uh, with our partners on the ground to try and deconflict um, operations as best we can and to try and address those tensions head on and make sure that the focus stays uh, directly on ISIL. Yes, Kassim. Um, just follow up on uh, Ryan's question. Turkey is citing YPG presence in Membij for its uh, plans to move to the city. And we have heard months before that YPG elements have withdrawn from the city and last week we heard again that they are moving actually uh, last week they were moving last week and Turkey is still claiming that there are YPG elements in the city and this is unacceptable for Turkey do you could you confirm whether there is a YPG element still in Membij or not um, just yes, I think you and Others saw this weekend there was a, a very public announcement about uh, the YPG movement from Manbij to east of the Euphrates. As we've been saying all along, the uh, leadership of the, the YPG uh, had moved east of the Euphrates previously. And uh, yet, we again, we have heard the concerns expressed by Turkey. This is something we'll continue to, uh, to talk directly with uh, our Turkish counterparts. Uh, and to, to hear their concerns about it. There is, uh, there are local uh, forces in Manbij now that are securing Manbij uh, against the threat of ISIL returning uh, and uh, will continue to address Turkish concerns about the makeup of that, uh, those forces. Uh, but we heard very publicly uh, the announcement from the YPG that they were moving east of the Euphrates. That's consistent with the commitment that's been made uh, previously. And uh, we think that's a good thing. That's what we've called for and uh, will continue to call for. And uh, again, the vast majority of those uh, forces uh, for some time have been east of the Euphrates. And uh, we think that's a good thing. And again, consistent with the commitment that's been made to our leadership. President Erdogan said that the United States failed to keep its promise of moving, withdrawing these forces from the city. Could you just say us, uh, tell us whether, but when, when for this administration, left the office in January, the withdrawal of YPG from Mambish will be completed. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm not going to predict uh, the future in a dynamic battle space right now. You know as well as anyone uh, the tensions in the region, the, the different players on the ground there. Um, what we do, what we have done as a leader of the coalition and as an ally of Turkey is try to be as transparent and as clear as possible with all of our partners about commitments made and about commitments that need to be uh, adhered to. And uh, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to play a role to try and deconflict uh, concerns among our partners and allies about what's happening on the ground and keep the focus on ISIL. We've been uh, successful in doing that so far. And uh, again, we'll continue to have those conversations with Turkey 
uh, with our partners on the ground to try and, and again, keep that focus on ISIL and make sure that uh, these tensions do not detract from the ultimate goal we all share, and that is to, to eliminate ISIL from Syria. Could you confirm whether still there are some YPG elements in Manbij or not? Um, I, like you, I saw the uh, announcement this past weekend. Uh, it's a commitment that we've heard previously, and uh, we think it's a good thing if indeed those forces have left. I cannot tell you with 100% uh, certainty the disposition of every single uh, person in Manbij and where they came from. As you know, there are some Kurds from uh, Manbij itself, uh, and in some cases uh, it's uh, the view as to who those local forces are in Manvij, there may be differing views as to who, uh, what groups they represent. So uh, I'm not going to sp speak from here without being on the ground myself in Manvij, able to identify everyone myself. Jennifer. Um, Peter, thank you. President-elect Trump said last night that he's going to ask the Defense Department and Joint Chiefs to come up with a comprehensive plan to protect the country's critical infrastructure from cyber attack. Does Secretary Carter think that the critical infrastructure is vulnerable to cyber attack right now? And if so, what needs to be done to protect it? So I'm, I applaud your efforts to try and drag me into the back into the campaign or into the transition. Uh, I'm not going to comment on, on uh, specific things that the President-elect's talking about in terms of policy choices he may pursue when he takes office. What I can tell you. Uh, is that this is a Secretary of Defense who's been incredibly focused on the cyber threat facing this country. Uh, he's articulated a cyber strategy that he's detailed on multiple occasions. Uh, he is uh, committed uh, uh, once again in terms of the top priority for our cyber strategy is to protect our own networks. And also, as we've seen in, in the ISIL fight, to use, uh, be prepared to use uh, our cyber capabilities uh, in an active area of, of hostilities in, in terms of uh, uh, confronting our enemies. And uh, I think the Secretary feels uh, good about the steps that we've taken to bolster our digital defenses. Uh, you've noted even yesterday the latest initiatives that have been taken with regard to following up to the Hack the Pentagon initiative, the ability to bring the private sector, the white hat hackers, to help us bolster our digital defenses. These are steps that have not only been are unprecedented for the Department, they're unprecedented for the federal government. And we think this is a very effective way to try and enhance our uh, cybersecurity. Uh, but there is still work to be done, to be sure. This is an evolving threat, a challenging threat. And uh, one thing the Secretary wants to make sure is that uh, it's a threat that we continue to address and, and uh, adjust our, our own posture accordingly. Phil. Has the uh, cyber war against Islamic State lived up to the Secretary's expectations over the last half year? I think the Secretary would say that uh, he still has uh, the entire operation against ISIL right now uh, because it is still a work in progress. He's not satisfied with any of it. He'd like to see this done. He'd like to see ISIL defeated in Iraq and Syria. He'd like to see every aspect of uh, the campaign enhanced and strengthened. Uh, he's talked a lot about uh, taking advantage of opportunities and accelerating the pace of this campaign. Phil, you've heard him multiple times. and I think it's fair to say that he has that view about the cyber operation as well. Will, at what point will ISIL be defeated and degraded and defeated? I mean, you, you guys have said this for two years now. The goal is to defeat and destroy. You're, not, you're attacking Raqqa. You're attacking Mosul. The, they're two major capital areas. At what point will the secretary and you from the podium be able to say, we've military defeated them. Now it's more of a counterterrorism campaign. Well, I think the first step, uh, Tony, and you've heard the secretary articulate it, is obviously is to to defeat them in Mosul and Raqqa, their so-called capital, or their so-called caliphate, and that that will be a very significant step in terms of militarily defeating them geographically and defeating the, getting rid of the idea, the, the notion that there can be a, 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 a so-called Islamic State in the first place. Uh, and we're well on the way to doing that in both Mosul and Raqqa with the help of those local forces who are in the lead, Iraqis and Syrians. Um, but that is not sufficient to dealing with the ISIL threat. That's why we have to deal with the metastasis of ISIL in places like Libya and places like Afghanistan. Uh, elsewhere, uh, it may pop up, they may pop up around the world. Uh, and so I don't think the Secretary believes that this is a fight that's going to be over any time soon in terms of the threat ISIL will continue to to pose, um, but it will be a different kind of threat, a different kind of challenge, and maybe less military at that point. 
at some point, will he be prepared to say, we feel that we have militarily defeated, destroyed, defeated ISIL? I think he will uh, be, we certainly uh, hope and expect to be in a position in the not too distant future to be able to point to Mosul and Raqqa, uh, the two largest cities where ISIL maintains geographic control to say that they no longer control those areas, just as they don't control Rutba, they don't control uh, Sharkat, they don't control uh, Tikrit. Uh, a number of cities, locations, Ramadi, Fallujah, these are locations that ISIL controlled not too long ago. They no longer control. That militarily, yeah. and those, that would be a very significant step, but the Secretary has been abundantly clear that that will not be sufficient in and of itself, that there is additional fight to come. Right. Additional fight to come will be a worldwide counterterrorism campaign against their groups. And there may be, uh, Tony, of course, pockets of resistance, ISIL resistance in Iraq and Syria sure. uh, that may need to be addressed as well. But you, th you feel you're getting closer to militarily defeating ISIL? I think the defeat of ISIL in Mosul and Raqqa would go a long way towards ending any notion uh, that there is anything uh, anything close to an Islamic State. Uh, the, the, the fiction that there's a caliphate out there, a geographic location for people to go to. Uh, and uh, But again, that is the first step in this, but there's still more to do in terms of dealing with the the threat that ISIL may pose into the future. But it would be a significant step, a major blow, and one uh, that the United States and the Department of Defense, along with our international coalition, but most importantly, those local forces on the ground that we've enabled, uh, will have achieved. And it will be a, a significant, uh, significant achievement, but it is not enough. Uh, more needs to be done. Of the Al Masri attack, was that a U.S. military attack or another agency attack? U.S. forces carried that out. U.S. military forces? Yes. And it was a drone or an unmanned, or a manned aircraft? It was an unmanned uh, aircraft. You said he was killed for his role in al-Qaeda. Can you say what that role was? He had a senior leadership role in, in al-Qaeda. Uh, and it's a role that, uh, again, he's been part of al-Qaeda for several years. Mentioned that it was back in Afghanistan as well. Uh, this is someone who helped uh, organize. Um, Al-Qaeda activities and was uh, directly affiliated with senior leaders there as well. And this is someone who has been on our radar for some time. Okay, I think I've tired you all out. If I don't see you, happy Thanksgiving and uh, safe travels if you're leaving the area.